you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Hello everyone, today I'd like to introduce you to Christine Doan, who's better known from riding in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. But Christine, I'd like you to go right back and I heard that your very first sentence was, I want a pony. Is that correct? Well, Glennis, that may be an apocryphal story, but it would (laughs) carry the grain of truth in it because as a very young child, And of course, this ages me. I'm 68 now. So I was a proper baby boomer born in 1949 in America. And even in America in 1949, a couple of years later, when I started to be a conscious individual, we had a milk cart that was drawn by a horse. (laughs) And as soon as I could walk, I was out there chasing the horse. For my second birthday, I was given a saddle, a little pony, an old pony saddle, which I devotedly rode on the back of the (laughs) sofa until at four years old, I had my first pony ride lessons. So I was determined at a young age to be a a rider. (laughs) Okay. Just tell me a little bit about then, you know, your first pony. Tell me a bit about how you actually started, how you became interested, because dressage is really your forte, but... Did you any ride any other way? Did you just do dressage? Did you do anything else? Well, in the Midwest, in the middle of Michigan, if you can think that Michigan is the one that looks like a glove with all the lakes around it, Mm -hmm. you can imagine that back in the 1950s, there was no recognition of the word dressage, much less anything that (laughs) looked like dressage. So everything was uh, Western. Mm -hmm. But my first experiences with horses were ponies, very small Shetland ponies, not mini Shetlands, but proper Shetland ponies that my cousin happened to have because her father was a trotting horse trainer. Okay. So I rode those ponies whenever I could. And I, one of my earliest memories is being, uh, is of being dragged around by Trigger of all ponies <laughs> because Trigger, after his very exhausting ride, I'm sure it was with a lot of hair all over him, pulled me to the water bucket. And I had my first experience of how brutally strong horses are compared to a tiny (laughs) four-year-old. Okay. All right. Now, Christine, what brought you to Australia? Well, you know, that was the 60s. And there were a few of us hardy souls who didn't just want to hang around the hate asbury and smoke dope and drop acid. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to see the world. So I basically threw a backpack on my back in quite a bit of emotional confusion as one is in one's late teens. And at that time, it was a very troubled time. There was a lot going on. It was very exciting. Mm -hmm. But it was very troublesome for all of us. We had not only the problems of late adolescence, but also the problems of uh, the late 60s and America, which was in total upheaval, internal upheaval, as well as external upheaval at the time. Mm -hmm. So I threw a backpack on my back and went off and I struck off west. I did happen to be in California at the time and struck off west looking for a guru to meditate with and some good dope to smoke, (laughs) 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 to be quite honest. (laughs) All right. And then you came to Australia, you arrived in Mm -hmm. North Queensland or were you in other parts? No, I landed in Sydney after spending three or four months hitchhiking around New Zealand. And I loved New Zealand. No idea why I didn't stay. But as I landed in the city, Sydney airport, which was a, I mean, it was a dump. It was a concrete bunker in those days. Mm-hmm. Think 1970. Sure. And strange enough, and I never was a city person, the minute I set foot on that concrete bunker, I thought, I'm not going to New Zealand. I've come to Australia. <laughs> of course, what I did was go and buy a $50 Holden, an old Holden, from yeah. two Canadians who were leaving the country at a youth hostel. And I drove all over Australia with that $50 Holden. And it was my saving grace because it had a ginormous maple leaf printed on the bonnet. So everybody took me for a Canadian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But when I finally found Far North Queensland, and let me tell you, in those days, the street signs were either illegible from mildew 
or, or non-existent, mm -hmm. or somebody used them for target practice and they were hanging straight down. <laughs> so finding the Atherton Tableland was not an easy trick. And I'm sorry, I cry every time I tell this story, Glennis. This is 50 <laughs> years later. And I, it still brings me to tears talking about going up the Gillies Highway and seeing the Tablelands out in front of me. And I just fell in love. Oh, wow. Yep. And I've always believed from that moment, I never fell out of love with the table ads. Mm -hmm. So here I am still, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. And you started your horses there. How did you start then to reinvent yourself as a horse person? Because you'd, you'd clearly been away from horses or, or what happened? Were you doing right? Yes. Yeah. Traveling as a traveler, as we called mm, ourselves mm. At that in those days, mm. was not conducive to anything to do with horses. But as soon as I settled down, mm. I started accumulating horses again. And of course, I used them to muster cattle, to go on trail rides, to do the National Trail, which was just in its incipient moments at that yes. time, to yes. do you know, things like the Bicentennial Ride. And mm -hmm. you know, there were all kinds of horsey activities I was involved in. But eventually, I had that tugging to go back to a more formalized form of riding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me and about, it, yeah, you, you know, your horse, your instructors, how that became, yeah. You know, it's a funny thing. I've always been, I've always stumbled upon things and realized when I had stumbled upon something in general. Mm. When I was a 10-year-old in Michigan where everybody rode Western, mm -hmm. My pediatrician had been made an offer. He was a fantastic pediatrician by some university somewhere, and he moved his family out of town with his older girls. And they had a beloved horse that they had to then sell. They chose my family because they knew the horse-mad little person I was. Yep. It turned out that after the First World War, the trainer of the horse had left the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a refugee and come to America. He had worked in Midland or just outside on the fringes of Midland for decades yep. Yep. in fear that he would be found by, I, I mean, it wasn't the Nazis at that point. He'd gone right through World War II and still thought they were fighting World War I. <laughs> okay. But he had been a rider at the Spanish riding oh, school. Wow. Wow. And so we would come home and say, gee, mom, Mr. Palfrey can make Jenny skip. So she could do flying changes every stride. <laughs> Gee, Mom, Mr. Pelvey can make Jenny jump when there's no jump. So she could do airs above wow. the ground. Yeah. This was a, a Morgan horse, a 12-year-old yeah. Morgan horse. I had no idea what my parents had bought for me, but they used to faithfully drive me out to Mr. Palfrey's, yeah. and he would put me on the lunge, and he insisted upon proper riding. Yes. I rode around this, I rode this horse that could do all these amazing tricks, mm. sometimes at a double bridle, at the tender age of 12, 13, when mm. nobody mm. knew what was going on. They were all Western riders around. <laughs> but that's where that initial inkling for dressage came from. Gee. I know. Okay. Amazing. That's, yes, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and fluky, you know, because as you say, okay. surrounded by people riding Western, Western yep. horses to just find a trainer in the middle of nowhere who, who wasn't going to charge you a fortune because he wouldn't want to get found out. I don't, I don't, I have no idea what the dollar exchange was. All I know is that this horse was purchased for me and I had this amazing opportunity. And of course, I never forgot it. Mm -hmm. I was always then going to be a dressage rider. Yep. Yeah. So you you started riding and competing in North Queensland because I know you came down to Southeast Queensland quite a lot in, yes. in that time. Yep. Yes. And then I had this iniquitous decision to make. I decided that late in life, because by this time I was 30, mm. I was going to make a decision as to whether I was going, I always think, did things a bit ahead of myself, but in a funny way, always a little bit too late. It's a funny pattern in my life. But the question was, if I really am going to get serious about dressage, I can't do it in far north Queensland. I mean, imagine far north Queensland in 1980. <laughs> you know, what, I mean, the riding here is, well, it's not exactly world class today. Mm -hmm. and, and back then there was just nothing that even looked like dressage. So mm -hmm. the decision was, I love Australia, but I love the Atherton Tablelands more than anything. Mm -hmm. 
do I move south and at that point learn third rate dressage or do I actually spend part of my year in Germany and try to learn first rate dressage? Mm -hmm. And look, off I flew to Germany. I had a contact from an American friend who was into dressage and off I went to learn. And this was my ambition at the time to learn to ride a 20 meter circle in working trot. Yep. But do it properly. Yes. Now, can I say that that ambition probably has never been reached? I've been to the Olympics, <laughs> but I would, I would not like to claim that I have ever ridden a seriously perfect 20-meter circle in working trot. But mm -hmm. that being the case, that's the kind of perfectionism that a dressage rider has to be imbued with mm -hmm. in order to um, get somewhere, in my view. Yep. You have to be dedicated yep. and to a very high ideal. So off I went to Germany, and hey, the rest is history, as they say. All right. Now, Christine, just to do with going to Germany, and you talked about holism and the effort mm -hmm. to bring everything together, mm -hmm. the fact that you rode in the Olympics, it wasn't just because you found a great trainer, found a great horse. What, what else was there? Because I know that, you know, you'd done a lot about energy healing, yep. you know, embodying the whole of the horse. So if you can tell us a bit about holism. Yeah, Glennis, it's interesting that, for example, now Australia looks pretty good to a lot of Americans, but I'll tell you, in 1970, it didn't look pretty good to a lot of Americans. <laughs> but didn't I make a good choice? <laughs> and, and have I ever regretted it? Not for one nanosecond. Mm -hmm. Never have I ever had the thought, why did I ever come to this country? <laughs> Never have I had that thought. Yep. But I've always sort of had a, an intuition about where I was going. And in the 70s, before I headed off to Germany, I began to involve myself in all forms of natural therapy for horses. Now, nobody was doing natural therapy for horses at that point. Mm -hmm. I had to learn, and I became a jack of all trades, master of none in natural therapy. So I learned about hydrotherapies, about meditation, about chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, homeopathy, shiatsu, energy healing, herbal medicine, uh, everything you can think of, mm -hmm. and applied it to horses. But I had to always transmogrify the system myself. So yep. even when Bowen came up in the 80s, yep. I, before Bowen for Horses was invented, I learned Bowen for people and yep. went and applied it to horses. Mm -hmm. So that was a really important thing for me to add into my bag of tricks, so to speak, when I went to Germany. However, the Germans were not exactly mm, accepting or wildly enthusiastic about any of my interest in natural therapies. Mm -hmm. In fact, probably the worst disagreements that I had with Rudolf Seilinger were over natural therapies. And of course, I also was very interested in natural horse keeping. Well, I can tell you back in the 80s, every German dressage horse lived in a box, never mm -hmm. saw a paddock, and mm -hmm. I was dead set against that method of horse keeping. So I became even more radical in my horse keeping, my holistic horse keeping at home. Mm -hmm. Now, those are all sort of funny stories that don't necessarily go anywhere. But I just think that young riders need to realize that it isn't enough to focus on your sport alone that you have to have a much broader view of where you're going and why you're doing things. And also to follow your own intuition of a particular way that you're going to exercise your sport. Mm -hmm. So for example, I was very interested in sports psychology and took it way beyond sports psychology with energy medicine and energy healing and things like that, meditation. But I think also being the first one who really had a serious go at training in Europe, I went and did something that I was heavily criticized for heavily criticized. Mm -hmm. And yet every, almost every rider since I went to the Barcelona Olympics has been in training in Europe, <laughs> dressage rider. Yes. And now we're finally getting to the point where we've built up enough stock of good riders, mm -hmm. much better quality horses. Oh my God, you should have seen, you remember the horses. Yes. From the yes. Oh yes. my heavens, you were there too. Yep. yep. We had really poor horse flesh for dressage, but today. Well, it was just getting them off the track, wasn't it? You know, oh, you, you go down the racetrack and and find a horse and, you know, these tall, lean thoroughbreds with a nice canter but not a very good walk and they'd be the dressage horses. Of course, what you what we all forget is that in those days, the race horses were distance 
gallopers, not sprinters. Yes. And that was a completely different kind of horse, <laughs> much more adaptable to dressage if you got a good one. Still, all ruined psychologically on the track, all, or almost all of them, and most mm-hmm. of them in physical incapacity. But today, we have horse flesh that we couldn't have dreamt of back in the 80s. Mm. In fact, we have some horse flesh in Australia today that the Germans couldn't dream of in the early 80s. Mm. Mm. So those things, you know, I still feel that it's very important for young riders, even older riders, to always focus on where is the sport going? Where am I going? Where does my intuition take me? What is my real strength in all this? Because I'll tell you what, if you have ambitions to compete internationally, it isn't enough just to be a technically good rider. It isn't enough to have a mommy or a daddy who has a lot of money. It just isn't enough. Christine, your favourite saying, horses are people too. We all know that horses have got their own distinct personalities, but can you speak a little bit about how it became your favourite saying and how often you use it? You know, Glennis, I grew up quite neurotic, quite frankly, (laughs) and I still have a lot of strands of neuroticism (laughs) drifting through my personality in spite of a lot of self-development work. And I, so I had a very young, very strong interest in psychology. Mm -hmm. Of course, kids today can hardly grasp how little sophistication we had in those areas, even 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. They can hardly grasp it because they have quite an almost instinctual, deep and sophisticated understanding of psychology. Of course, that takes a lot of maturation before it comes to something, but they start at a much higher base level than Mm -hmm. we did back then. We were still in Skinnerism and behaviorism. Mm -hmm. And it was very, you know, horse management was very materialistic from the point of view that the horse was seen as an object Mm. and hardly a person. But I very early, I think because of my interest in natural therapies egging me on, I saw horses as people. Mm -hmm. And as their emotions and their emotional lives is very deep and very individual and very, very pertinent to anything that had to do with that horse's happiness, trainability, eventual competitiveness, Mm -hmm. and that those aspects needed to be looked after in a horse as much as in a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a question of teaching them to put this foot here and that foot there and have their back like this and their hind leg at that angle. It was a question of finding the emotional way into a horse and Mm -hmm. using that. Okay. So from there, what what do you think to become a rider, you know, a rider or a rider, someone's going to work with horses, someone that's going to go on and do a little more than just, you know, I want a pony and Mm -hmm. do, do this professional at a base level, what core skills do they need to start just to get going oh to start? You know what? Oh um, yeah, oh someone straight oh out of school. How can you tell someone that's going to make it in the horse industry and someone that's going to not? You know, I've seen many great artists in my time with horses, mm. Mm. and I mean serious artists. And let me rephrase that: several great artists. And in general, I've also seen those great artists to be the people who could form an amazing connection to a horse. So Mm -hmm. they would have horses love them or have a real relationship with Mm -hmm. a horse. Whereas mostly when people tell me their horse loves them, I think, well, that's really covered love, you know. (laughs) 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 But having said that, I have seen human beings with a very strong connection to a horse and an amazing artistry about the way that they train. Mm -hmm. Most of those people, and and not all of them, but most of them were dreadful business people, Mm -hmm. absolutely dreadful business people. It's quite an opposite sort of a skill. It's much more the artist as opposed to the person who can deal with the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if I were going to talk to a young person today, and I don't do this too often in the horse world, but every once in a while I get a phone call where some young person is very keen to get moving. Mm -hmm. And I say, if you don't have the strength and persistence and tenacity Mm -hmm. to stick out a really difficult task and really difficult business, if you don't have the ability to deal with people as well as horses on a quite a bit deeper level, but to on the surface be as 
tough as nails, don't even start. Yep. Okay. Don't okay. even start. It's yep. a tough, tough, tough business. And it looks romantic and it looks wonderful. But I tell you, when I was running my facility up here and I had all the connections to Europe, I had the horses, I had the knowledge, I had the competition background, I had everything. And yet, who shoveled shit on Christmas? Yep. 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 You still have to shovel shit. Yep. <laughs> you still have to shovel shit. Yeah. So there's no way, I mean, of course, the super rich may not, but there's almost no way around the toughness, mm-hmm. the mental toughness that's required. Mm-hmm. 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 And now going on, because, you know, of the, oh, let's say, hundreds of thousands of people, I, I don't know, a number you know, that yeah. work in the horse industry. So yeah. there's lots and lots of people who are professional, who make a living, who have the strength and the persistence and the tenacity that you talk about. Mm-hmm. What makes the people excel? The people who say, you know what, I'm going to go to Europe mm. and I'm going to ride in the Olympics. What mm. is the extra that people need for that type of um Here's where I go back to the individual. Yep. And I could pick several individuals in Australia, but I'm not going to pick on anyone else except myself, Mm -hmm. but could be anything from being able to pick the horse that suits you perfectly Mm -hmm. to having a sort of almost a medical intuition about which horse that has a problem with his health, say, fails the vet, but Mm -hmm. you have a feeling that that horse can actually hold up for, or you can keep it going, or you have connections, or you have just dogged persistence, whatever it is that you have, there will be skills that every single one of you listening out there has, and you have to find that skill because Mm -hmm. everyone finds his way, and I would guess this is the same in every sport, everyone finds his way to the top. And going to the Olympics means that, I mean, I consider myself to work my way up to being the worst of the best. (laughs) That that was as good as I got. But I was happy to be the worst of the best. (laughs) I'm not exactly built for riding. I started way too late. I started in a country where you you shouldn't start from. And with way too little money. I spent a lot of money on myself Mm -hmm. and my horses, but way too little money. I mean, you, you have friends like I remember talking to... Ita O'Higgins Young, who divorced her husband, who was, his name was Ken. And it was only after the divorce that she said, yes, Kenny left me 45 Kmart. So the K in Kmart was from Ken's first name. Now, you imagine the wealth of these people. Yes. Back, back in the 80s, Ita sort of disclosed to me, you know, Christine, this was a, an intimate disclosure mm. back then. I... I it's so hard to find a million dollars in after-tax income. Well, mm. you know, mm. I, yes, I was, I was be- like every other Australian. I was begging, borrowing, doing everything but stealing to get myself to Europe and to be able to afford a horse. And we were competing against the Swarovskis and the people who, uh, in their divorce settlements, had forty-five Kmart shopping centers. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you know, but a lot of those rich people never made it. Mm. And a few of us with extreme talent, I, I think of a, a person well-known in Australia, Leonie Bramall, who was a great friend of mine, extreme talent, excellent training, had a horse, almost got there, horse didn't pass the vet. Why? Because they had to throw, this is my opinion, Yep. they had to throw somebody besides Christine Stuckelberger out. Ah. And Leonie was the fall guy. Okay. That horse didn't need to fail the vet, but mm, they need mm. the judges needed to have somebody fail the vet. Leone had a talent that I will never in my life have, had training that I will never have, had an ability to train that I would couldn't even I, I can't even come close to her her in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm, and yet mm-hmm. I got there and and she didn't. Etha had incredible amounts of money. She didn't get there and I did. I I can't tell you what the combination of things is. But some measure of it is just dumb luck. Okay. Some of it is just dumb luck. But you still have to be willing to take those punches. Now, poor Leone really had a bad punch that she couldn't come back from because what do you do at that point? But we had our own. There were five of us over in Europe training. Mm -hmm. And we understood that we were going to be nominated for the Olympics. And at one point, the chief judge at the time Herr Nickley from Switzerland. Mm-hmm. I was in England and he said to me, Christine, you have a wonderful horse. He never bothered to praise my riding. <laughs> Christine, 
you have a wonderful horse. You, why hasn't your um, federation nominated you for the Olympics? I said, Ternigli. And of course, in those days, we had no internet, no mobile yes, phones, no yes. bloody nothing. You, know, yep, you, had to, yep. you had to find your way to a telephone that could mm, do an mm. international and the cost and then, <laughs> or, or send a telegram or whatever. I mean, how did we ever survive? But it turned out that we were, were indeed not nominated. Now, you think how difficult it is to get a late nomination in to, say, the Far North Equestrian Group competition <laughs> down the road in August, you know? Yeah, yeah. Imagine how difficult it is to get a late nomination recognized for the Olympics. Mm, mm, mm. Now, you know, there I, I was going to be done over by politics just the way Leone was. Mm -hmm. But through some combination of contacts, persistence, pers I mean, I wrote letters to the Queen. Yep, <laughs> you know, yep, I yep. Did, okay. I didn't Determination, have, I didn't yep. yep. I did yep. everything. And, of course, uh, it turned out that my father, who was an eminent business person, had some very good contacts in Spain, and that might have helped. Nobody knows. Yep. Nobody, in the end, nobody knows why they allowed that nomination. But what I do know is that dressage is a subjectively judged sport, and the judges all have a lot of friends who are riders and trainers and owners. Mm -hmm. And if you start out with a black mark against you, you will never be judged on your merits. Now, that's not a problem for me because, in fact, I was very keen on going to the Olympics, but so were my other four mm -hmm. who, were, who were trying as well. Yep. But we ended up with one spot and I had the scores mm -hmm. and no one else had the scores, so I went. But, okay. of course, I had, here we are. How do you put that package together? Mm. I had bought a horse for 12,000 Daymark. Mm -hmm. Now, that's about 12,000 euros. I mean, let's call it the equivalent, yep. $15,000. Yeah. And that turned out to be one of the five best horses in the world. Yeah. And I kept that horse away from Philly Schulteis, who was my train, my chief trainer at the time, because uh, I knew that he was past being interested, to be ambitious about taking a not very good rider, like <laughs> not very talented rider like myself, and a funny country like Australia, and really backing that with all he was worth. Yep. But I knew that Rudolph, who was the head rider for Billy Schulteis at the time, uh -huh. was not only super talented, but also totally unknown uh -huh. and very ambitious. And so between Rudolph and me, we managed to get that horse into Rudolph's stable yep. rather than into Herr Schulteis's. Okay. And, and as they say, the rest is history. But, you know, once again, how did this work out? I ended up putting a team together because it's always a team, the rider, the horse, sure. and the trainer. Yep. And I, how did I get that horse? I mean, it turned out that it had been taken to auction with fake papers. <laughs> Okay. And it was never paid for okay. at auction. So in the end, I had to make an arrangement with the Oldenburg Society. And by that time, they realized what a good horse it was. So they were they were compliant. Yeah. I, I had to pay for the horse a second time to get oh, his real nice. name to the Oldenburg Breed Society. So okay. you, you can't imagine. And every single rider who's gone to the top. Yeah. And I consider going to the Olympics gone to the top. I, you know, yeah. even though I say I'm the worst of the best, I worked my way up to being the worst of the best. That was still with the great new unknown trainer of the whole dressage universe mm, mm. because it was with my horse that Rudolph became famous. Yep. And that was with a horse that it just turned out was one of the best horses in the world. Yeah. And I never would have made it without that combination. Mm. So it's always this package, but everybody's package and everybody's difficulties are different. Mm. Mm. And if you would do an interview with every single person who would be as honest as I am about their trials and tribulations, yep. instead of painting a beautiful picture that, oh, it was just wonderful, and had this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful yeah. trainer, yeah. blah, 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 you would hear horrifying stories. Just okay. horrifying stories of what each one of us has had to go through. Okay. And what pain and difficulty that has caused in our lives in order to satisfy, well, what amounts to our ambitions. Christine, your horse, I mean, he was only, he was eight, wasn't he, when you rode in the Olympics? He was the youngest yeah. horse in the 
Barcelona and yep. I was the least experienced rider. Yep. And I can tell you that having, I mean, it wasn't very, wasn't very usual to have an Australian mm. with an American accent, if they yes. could discern that, yes. who, spoke, who spoke very good German. I spoke, okay. I spoke excellent German. Mm-hmm. I could, I never learned to ride as well as I learned to speak German. <laughs> But I was good at languages. I had more talent for languages than writing. You know, everything helps a little bit. So Mm, my German mm. helped me. Mm -hmm. And it certainly helped me make friends around the world because people who couldn't speak German but could speak English or French talked to me. Yep, yep. So uh, writers or whatever. And, you know, it's back to how do you make advantage of your strengths Mm. rather than worrying about your weaknesses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, these people had... They, they'd watched me struggle because they knew I was struggling. Yes, and they knew yes, that yes. We didn't exactly in those days have the backing of our federation, our national federation. It's so much better today, Glennis, and mm, people may mm. complain about it, but it's so much better today. Yep. And they watched me doing my yoga in the aisles of the stables <laughs> at competitions. Now, mm-hmm. this was in those days the weirdest thing that Europeans could imagine. Mm, I mean, mm. these days, everybody does yoga. But then to be sitting and meditating on a bale of hay in front of my horse's box was just, or standing on my head or doing all these weird poses. It, I, I was sort of like their pet almost because <laughs> <laughs> I was friendly. I spoke good German. I wasn't a threat because mm-hmm. even though I had a good horse mm-hmm. and a good trainer, I didn't have the background. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the friends. I didn't have the contacts. I didn't have the raw talent. I didn't have the money mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. a threat. Mm. So I had this wonderful situation of being almost, yeah, treated like sort of a, a mascot almost or a little pet. You know, they sort of saw me as an eccentric oddball from so far away that they can't even imagine where it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when I left the arena in Barcelona, of course, I was going to be followed by Isabel, who was going to win the gold medal. Mm, so mm. all the, there's always a segment, a section of the of the arena where all the riders and trainers sit. Yep. And of course, we all knew each other. Of yes. course, we all knew each other. It was such a small group of people then. So it didn't matter where you were from. We all knew each other. Mm-hmm. And I had the warmest round of applause. Oh, that's people. lovely. This, yeah. this also yep. makes me yep. cry. Yep. Because... They saw their mascot rise to the challenge, Mm. (laughs) and they saw that wonderful horse who Mm. was so young Mm. and so Mm. inexperienced just say, yes, Rudolph, I'll take Christine around the Grand Prix test, and I'll do the right thing for you. And and he, he did it for the trainer. Now, those people, whether they consciously understood that or not, Mm. they understood that. Mm. Mm. And they were right behind me barracking for me. It was like being at at a a grand final. Wow. It was wonderful. Now, Christine, I know this is hard and you've just about got me yes. in tears. So I'm going to keep yes, you in I'm tears. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but you had to sell him then to come back to Australia. Yes. Yeah, it must be, you know, the pain of selling a horse that you love. And I don't want you in tears again. Yes, <laughs> but sorry. can you tell me a little bit about what happened then afterwards? Okay, how that- well, I was so much in debt that mm. I had to sell the horse. And of mm. course, the horse was at that point this amazingly valuable property. Hmm. And it was an object of utmost desire by sure. many people yep. who had the money to spend on a horse like that. Mm-hmm. But the thing that was, and, and I'll, uh, I'll try to keep from blubbering about this, but mm. this is what broke my heart. You know, that horse loved its trainer. The mm-hmm. horse, Dondolo loved Rudolf Seilinger. Yep. And he probably went to his retirement loving Rudolf Seidman. Mm-hmm. He did his work at Barcelona for me because he told Rudolf he would. If you see what I'm saying. <laughs> I loved the horse, but the horse actually loved the trainer. The horse had no feelings for me, in my view. In my mm-hmm. view. Mm-hmm. I was grateful to the horse. I loved the horse. I'd done all this work. He'd taken me to the Olympics in spite of all these obstacles. And to sell this magnificent creature under those circumstances was just hurt. Mm, mm, mm. It was record breaking. That was fine. Mm. It's, that's a great story to tell. I, I'm not allowed to tell it, of course, because the, there was a gag order that's still in force on that contract that I would never disclose the sum of money. Okay. But of course, it so was, that won't be my next question then. Well, well I mean, it's it's a long time ago. Mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> we're, yeah. We're, we're getting a, we're getting yeah. a long way away from 1992. Yeah. What I can say, without breaking that 
contract, which yeah. I never have broken, mm. is that in the press in Australia, it was widely bruited about that that horse was sold for 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. The press sometimes gets it right. Okay. Yeah. But I needed the money because I was that, I was almost that much in debt. Yes. But it will never it will never satisfy the pain. For sure. Never. And, and look, every one of you listening, I'm guessing that every one of you listening has a pain story about losing a horse you loved that will be able to relate to this. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. It's glamorous because of the amount of money, because the horse took me to the Olympics, because that was the horse that started Rudolf Seilinger's glittering career. Mm -hmm. But the pain of losing a horse you love, I don't know a horse person who doesn't know that pain. Mm. Mm. You know it, Glennis. Mm. Mm. You know it. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yep. All right. I want you to go on now, and I, I don't know. You know, the proudest moment, I think you just talked about it. Is that is that the so. proudest moment? Yep. I think yep. so. Yep. Being recognized by my peers, being recognized by a group, an elite group of riders and trainers and owners who all knew each other and all had more or less grown up together, and this stranger in their midst who had worked her little backside off but was as odd as hell. <laughs> and how did she ever end up with this trainer and that horse? They couldn't even figure it out. Yep. And yet yep. there they were all barracking for me. Yeah. And yeah. with this warm show of solidarity, mm -hmm. that probably was, I think I'd pick that over any championship round or any ribbon giving ceremony or yep. any, yep. any other moment Yep, because it was so heartwarming. All right, I'm going to take you back to your role as a coach because not only yes. are you a rider, an Olympian, a co you, you're sort of doing everything as well. We haven't even touched on your breeding. Um, as a coach, what's a training tip for people just to improve their riding handling skills? You know, just something that um, if you're coaching, just something that you see again and again. It can be at a basic level, it can be a high level, but just something that you think if all riders could do this, that would improve their riding. I think the most important thing that a rider can do mm -hmm. is have an ongoing and trusting relationship with a trainer coach because there are so many elements to riding, just like there are so many elements to getting to the Olympics or to yep, yep, winning yep. even a, a prelim, a yep. prelim, you know? Yep. But the relationship with a trainer coach mm -hmm. is of primary importance. And I see people skipping from person to person and, you know, we got a famous person coming, I'll have a lesson from them. I think this long standing relationship with a mentor, coach, trainer mm -hmm. that you trust and that, and that doesn't mean you never have a lesson from anyone else. Yes. But okay. th that's an ongoing relationship. I, I cannot see that as uh, anything but a foundation for a uh, for longstanding achievement. Yeah. All right, um, Christine and I. And, I sorry, and in I, fact, I, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to throw this in because mm. I feel that at the end of my coaching career, I've stumbled upon the the student. I, I hesitate to call her a student. Marcella Adkins is my only is the only person that I work with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing other things besides horses these days. Yep. Yep. But once a week, faithfully, I'm at Marcella's working with her on two or three or sometimes four different horses. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing this for now 10 years. Okay. Now, now, and Marcella is by far the most talented person I've ever worked with, but she's also the most dedicated and persistent and self-critical mm -hmm. mm -hmm. rider that I've ever worked with. Okay. But it's that long-standing work that has brought us to the point where from far north Queensland on crappy horses. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that most of which has just been sort of fallen into our laps. Yep. That Mar Marcel has gone and done well and been noticed in uh, statewide competition. Now okay. she'll move on to something more next year with any luck. Yep. But I see that relationship and I certainly don't see it as a teacher student relationship. I see it as a, friend to friend, mentor, mentoree, uh, it's a much closer relationship than mm -hmm, that. And mm -hmm. I would urge anyone who can establish that kind of a relationship with a trusted, knowledgeable horse person yep. to establish that relationship. Okay. 
All right. Now, I'll throw, I might be throwing you in the deep end here because I don't know no, if I, if I uh, <laughs> asked you about this. A book. Can you recommend a book for our listeners? You know, I read so widely in the old days when we only had books. Yep. But I haven't spent a lot of time online. But my guess is that these days we have something better than books. And Mm -hmm. I almost hate to say that. But when you're talking about riding, Mm. it's such a kinesthetic act that a book can never do it justice. So Mm -hmm. if you don't, yes, I think everyone should read. I'm a very theoretical human being myself. And in fact, Rudolph said to me several times, Christine, If you weren't so smart, even I couldn't have gotten you to the Olympics. (laughs) (laughs) So once again, you take your skill and you use it. If you're not a theoretical person, you don't need theory. Mm -hmm. However, for most of us, we need a bit of theory to back up our practice. And, And these days, I think my same advice would apply. Find your best few trainers that you really trust yep. or riders or whatever online and really study those videos. Mm-hmm. Really study what they have to say. Watch them teaching other people because almost everybody does this. Yep. You know, go to master classes. Figure out how the coach and the trainee interact together and how they interact with the horse. That is and and how that kinesthetically fits together and try to feel your way into what that means for mm-hmm. sitting on your own horse. Okay. Yep. I, th- I think I'd say I-, I feel like I'm betraying my very literary past, <laughs> but I think I'd say read books, but study videos. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, you've said that you don't do, you do very little coaching these days. What does your future hold? Do you have any any future with horses? Will you continue to teach Marcella? Will you be supporting her when she travels? Yes, certainly. I'm very devoted to Marcella. She has become a very close friend. I'm absolutely in total admiration of her talent, her mm-hmm. persistence, her ability to self-criticize, her ability to um, listen to a few clues and then turn that into something amazing. I, of course, met Marcella long after I stopped riding, so I was never able to say, Marcella, you don't get contact. Let me get on this horse and establish the contact, and you get on it after me and have a feel. Sure. Yep. So, you know, that that long term relationship building Mm. with that with that special person has been a unique and very important relationship for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I'm 68. Who knows how long I'll keep doing this, but I will stick with Marcella as long as she'll stick with me. Great. Great. Now, can you sum up your philosophy into a lesson today for our listeners? Treat every human being with the respect with which you'd like to be treated and make sure that every human around you, and I haven't always stuck to this, don't, don't think that I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm preaching something that I have not always done and do not always do, but I'm working on it. Treat yep. every horse with the same respect that you want those people to treat you. Okay. I think that's really important. You mm-hmm. need to have an, uh, a level of respect that goes beyond respect to probably closer to love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Christine, how can people contact you? Oh, uh, they can find me on Christine at cddressage.com. They yep. can ring, ring me on 0419-656-247. I take phone calls from strangers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, and they can Google me and find me. Anywhere, okay. So. And we, we'll have those contact details on oh, the bottom yes. of your horse, okay. horse chats page as well. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Christine. And that was wonderful. And I will yes. uh, be talking to you soon. I've, I've had so much fun doing this. Thank you. Even yeah. though I've been bursting into tears from time to time. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a real trip down memory lane. Good. And I hope, I've, I hope I've been able to give something to your listeners that's yeah. real and sincere and Good. authentic. Good. You certainly have. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Glennis. Bye. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.